Lord God, we thank you that you are our good, good Father. And it seems like there just aren't enough superlatives to, to de describe how great and awesome and wonderful you are. We just thank you that you pour out your love on us, and there aren't enough negative terms to describe us. But Lord, you choose to love us anyway, and we just thank you so much for your love. Be with us as we hear from your word today. Speak to each and every one of us. And let us be faithful and obedient to what you are teaching us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'll invite you to go ahead and take your Bibles or your Bible apps and find Psalms chapter 100. Psalm 100. There's only five verses in Psalm 100. That song is one that I remember as a young child memorizing at uh, a vacation Bible school. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord and starts out. And it was so nice to see you just singing out to the Lord. You know, you may not think you can sing very well, some of you, but you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I just felt like as I was watching you, you were just singing and, and just crying out to God with all your hearts. And it was a beautiful thing. We might just have to randomly invite some of you to come join us on the stage so you can see what's happening. <laughs> Don't give me a microphone. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's the truth. It is the truth. Wow. I've heard of a face, a face that only a mother can love, but she doesn't even have a voice that you can love. Well, we're talking about Thanksgiving. Some of you see the word Thanksgiving in the title of the sermon, and you might think that I'm off by a few months. And you might be right. Who knows? There might, I've been known to be off a, a, a time or two in my life. But to some, the call to Thanksgiving happens when it's time to eat turkey. How many of you know that call? Okay, it's time to eat. <laughs> Dinner's ready. I would imagine that every Thanksgiving message around, you know, back in November or around Thanksgiving holiday, every time that a preacher stands up and preaches a Thanksgiving message, it probably includes the following sentiment, something along the lines of, Thanksgiving is something that we can celebrate every day, not just once a year. And I think we would all agree. On a day today when we lost an hour of sleep, the temperature this morning was 17 degrees with a wind chill of 5. Un under these conditions, I doubt many of us woke up with an attitude of thanksgiving, <laughs> of gratitude. So here we go. We're talking about Thanksgiving in March. From childhood, we're taught to say thank you when someone does something nice for us. I know I remember the many times that my mother especially said, now what do you say when someone did something nice for me? And we're always taught we have to say thank you. We're given a gift and, or someone pays us a compliment or they extend a nice gesture to us and we acknowledge it by saying thank you. Hopefully we all do that. One of the most frustrating experiences, at least for me, is to receive an anonymous gift because you don't know who to thank. <laughs> and you just feel like, all my life I've been taught to say thank you. I need to go thank someone. Who, who, who would it be? And so that's a hard thing to deal with sometimes. But in spite of all of this, we sometimes forget to express our gratitude to our God. And in our text today, God issues a call to thanksgiving, not for his benefit, but for ours. So let's read together Psalms chapter, uh, chapter 100, verses 4 and 5. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. 
I can't help but think that we just sang these verses in all of those songs that we just sang. And there's two points I want to bring out of the text this morning. I'm just going to jump right into it. We lost an hour of sleep last night. Who knows, I might finish a little early and everybody get home, get a head start on their Sunday afternoon nap. <laughs> so the first thing that we're going to jump on is the invitation. There's an invitation. You know, there's an invitation for a lot of things. God's always inviting us to join us in his presence. He invites us to receive his salvation, and he invites us to enjoy his blessing. He invites us to bring thanksgiving to him. If you look in verse 4, you see a couple of terms there. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. He's calling us to come. Come on in. Throws the door wide open. Obviously, he would not enter, issue such an invitation if the gates were not open, if the court was not open and available. And so he says, come, and we are told to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. He knows that thanksgiving is good for us. He knows that thanksgiving is good for us, and so he makes himself constantly available to us so that we can come to him and express our thanks to him. How many times have you even thought years after an event when someone did something nice to you and you're still thankful? You're still so grateful for what that person did for you, what that person did to help you out in a maybe even in a desperate situation. And I, I can off the top of my head I can think of several things uh, that, that just made big impacts in my life. People to whom I am very thankful for their influence in my life. And unfortunately, I don't know that if I've adequately expressed gratitude to them. And if I'm like that with people, I know I'm like that with God. <laughs> God has done so much for me. And he has just, he has just blessed me in so many ways, far beyond anything I ever deserved. And there's a lot of times I don't even say thanks. He opens those doors so that any moment we can come to him, any moment we can come to him and express our gratitude because every moment we have reason to be thankful. Every moment we can come to him. So it's more about thanksgiving is something that's good for us. Thanksgiving humbles us. We have to humble ourselves to offer thanks. And Thanksgiving reminds us of who he is. We're just saying you're a good, good father. It's who you are. And that I am loved by him. It's who I am. It reminds us of who we are as well in our relationship with God. So it's good for us. And maybe even more so than it is for him. He issues that invitation to thanksgiving. This is David writing these words. And so uh, David knew as well as anybody how good it is to be able to come and sing praises and thanks to the Lord. I mean, you may remember the verse where David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And he was looking forward to going and expressing thanksgiving, among other things, to God. The second point is the inclination. God offers the invitation. The invitation is open, and it's always open. He's always available. The inclination for us to offer our thanksgiving, where does that come from? How are we motivated to give thanks to God? I think in verse 5, we're given three reasons to that we should be thankful to God. First of all, we see his goodness. The very first thing, for the Lord is good. His goodness. We should, we should be thankful for his goodness. And this is repeated throughout Scripture. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 36 echoes this very text that we're reading today. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love is endures forever. It seems like we may have sung that somewhere along the line this morning as well. 
And in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus himself said, there is no one good except God alone. So really, he's very unique. He's, uh, he's holy. He's pure. He's perfect. There is no other one like him. In fact, that was my verse of the day. If I pull that up for you this morning, it was in Samuel where they said, who is a God like you? We've never even heard of a God like you. There is no one like you. He is a unique, holy God. and His goodness is like no other. In Psalm 107, verse 8, it's almost as if the psalmist is begging people to give thanks to God. He says, oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. You know, I, we live in a world full of distractions, and it's so easy just to lose sight of God's goodness, especially in the world that we live in. There are so many negative things, so many things that may even cause us to question God's goodness. We need to constantly remind ourselves that the Lord is good. The second characteristic of God that we see that is worthy of thanksgiving is his love. His steadfast love endures forever. You know, there's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we know that as the love chapter. Uh, you'll hear it read at a lot of weddings, and uh, it's very familiar to us. But it, 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 it provides us with a description of God's perfect love. I, I could start it off right now. Many of you could probably finish it where it says love, a uh, God is uh, love, love is patient, love is kind. You could replace the word love with God. God is patient. God is kind. God is all of these things. And because God is love, and so we're reminded of his love. That's a reason for us to offer thanks to him, thank him for his love. God's love, he, he loves us even when we are unlovable and uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for it for us you know God loves us when we're unlovable it's not just something that he talks about but it's something that he's already proven he's proven his love by sending Jesus to die for us on the cross God's love is <clears throat> always with us. Again, in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul says, For I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We just mentioned a minute ago, there are times that we can be very unlovable. There can be other times in our lives when we don't feel very loved. And regardless of what we're experiencing in this world of, of lies and deception, God loves us. God loves us. And, all, and he, as we said a moment ago, he proved that by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. What more proof do we need? As long as we can remind ourselves of that and we know that Christ lives within us his spirit lives within us constantly to remind us of his love and his presence in our lives the third thing that we see in verse 5 is that we can thank God because of his faithfulness his, his faithfulness endures to all generations I love uh, Jeremiah reminds us, and he actually wrote the book of Lamentations. When you hear the word Lamentations, at its root is the word lament. Jeremiah is known as the, the weeping prophet. He, was all, he saw the worst of the worst as experienced by Israel. He saw that they were led off into captivity. He saw that they were defeated. He witnessed all of these things, God's judgment against Israel and so as you read his writings in the book of Jeremiah and in the book of Lamentations you can literally hear him cry he's crying for his brothers and sisters in, in, in Israel who are experiencing such hardship 
in such bad times. But in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, he says this. He says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We're all very, very familiar with that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, that comes right out of these verses. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, in the midst of everything that he is witnessing and everything that he is experiencing, yet he writes these words, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Paul echoes this truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his, his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He reminds us that each and every one were called into this fellowship with a faithful God. And again, he refers back to that, that proof, that, that evidence that God offers Jesus Christ, his Son. I want to share a story with you of God's faithfulness. You may have heard it before, but in the late 1800s, George Mueller, he was known as a preacher and an evangelist, and uh, he helped found, actually, the Plymouth Brethren Movement, and he's also known, most commonly probably, for operating an orphanage in England that at one time had a thousand orphans at one time. He served, he, he served thousands and thousands and thousands of orphans through the time of his ministry, but there was a time that they had 1,000 orphans in their orphanage at one time. Couldn't even imagine that. I've got a pile of kids in my house, but uh, <laughs> thousand. <laughs> but over his years of ministry, he cared for more than 10,000 orphans. One morning at the orphanage, there was no food to eat. Nothing to feed the children. But, but he called all the children and the staff together, and they sat at the table together, and he led them in a prayer. And in that prayer, he thanked God for the provision of food, even though there was no food. He thanked God for providing food, even though there was no food. You see, God is a faithful God. And when you walk in faith with your faithful God, you begin to experience the fulfillment of his promises. You begin to understand more and more what he is doing and how he works. You begin to trust more and more in his faithfulness. God is faithful to fulfill his promises and execute his plans. A few moments after Mueller finished his prayer, a baker knocked on the door. And he said that God had led him to bake bread the night before just to give it to the orphanage. But that's not all. Before the bread could even be served to the children, a milkman knocked at the door. He said that his milk wagon had broke down right in front of the orphanage. And rather than let all that good milk go to waste, he wanted to give it to the children. George Mueller gave thanks even when it took faith to do so. Before he had any food, he was thanking God for the food that God provided. He just didn't know how God had already provided it. You know, it's so easy to thank God for the good things in our lives. But are we truly thankful for all things? I imagine everyone here has had a challenging season in your life at some point or another. In fact, I'm sure it's safe to say that you've had multiple challenging seasons in life. I'm sure there were times where you wondered what God was up to, or maybe even if he was even there. Believe it or not, we can be thankful even in those challenging times. All it takes is a change in perspective. Maybe God was 
withholding something from us for our own good. Protecting us from something that would harm us. Something that we couldn't even see. Maybe God was allowing us to go through those experiences so that we could learn something about ourselves or about him. Something that we otherwise never would have learned about God or about ourselves. Maybe God is using those times of trials to mold us into the image of Christ. Even in the midst of difficult and challenging times, we can enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We can give thanks to him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Thanking God for everything, not just the good things, can completely change our perspective and make us far more grateful people. Thanking God in everything gets the focus off of us and what we've been given, and it puts the focus back on God, who is the ultimate giver. So embrace an attitude of gratitude and turn thanksgiving into thanks living. Let's pray together. Lord, as we've sung and as we've heard from your word, you are such a good, good father. You are so good to us, so much better than anything we deserve. Lord, sometimes we lose sight of that. Lord, sometimes we get our, our nose has been out of shape when things don't go exactly the way we want. When we come up against a challenging situation, we begin to whine and complain. Sometimes we need to step back and say, what makes us think we deserve something? Why is it that you've already been so good to us? Lord, just to take that step back and change our perspective just a little bit, allow you to show us that Thanksgiving is not so much for you as it is for our benefit. To help us just recalibrate. To understand who you are and who we are that we have every reason to offer our thanks to you. So Lord, help us leave here today with thankful hearts, always mindful of how good you are. And let us live our lives accordingly in a way that would bring you honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise because you are worthy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you we'd get out of here a little bit. <laughs> I hope you guys have a great week. God bless you. And live a life of thanks living this week.